grace scene and to see old friends and new faces and new friends. We're just so glad for all of you. We got a uh, subject today, maybe some of y'all's favorite, very favorite subject. I don't know. It's, it's going to be one word, but it's kind of like, uh, anybody here remember Brother Bobby Chandler? My evangelism days, we used to call in and, and uh, Brother Chandler would, uh, would ask him how church was doing, how service was going, and he'd uh, go into his descriptive terms about me. He'd say, oh, you should have been with us. He said, I just picked them up and floated them around, bumped their heads on the ceiling this morning in Sunday school. And he would carry on as only Brother Chandler could, and, uh, but he was telling me after one night service, he said, oh, man, we, we just... We, we preached to him, and he was excited and telling me a little bit. I said, really? That good, huh? I said, who'd you get that one from? And he said, oh, no, not this one. He said, this one wasn't even in the Bible. Now, you can't get any more original than it's not even in the Bible. That's original. But uh, what I'm going to preach on, the word that I'm going to use today is not even in your Bible. Oh, yes. Brother Chandler could get original. You remember um, Rojo the Fighting Cock? Anybody that old? That's pretty original. How about uh, Brother Chandler just done a 21-day fast? I was coming in from somewhere and evangelizing and had stopped in Racine. Brother Chandler was coming from Tennessee. He had just done a 21-day fast, and, uh, and somewhere on the journey from there to here, he stopped in and, and ate. And uh, they were playing a song, and it was Ain't No One Monkey Gonna Stop No Show. And uh, he come in here, and that night, that was his title, Ain't No One Monkey Gonna Stop No Show. And I remember very, very vividly that, that we had good church, amen, and uh, had a great touch of God. And God is in this place to minister to needs. How many believe it? I absolutely believe it. Philippians 4 and verse 6, if you have it, say, read it. Be careful for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your request be made known unto God. Another rendition says, Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your request be made known unto God. This is not a new subject. We're going to talk about that one word called worry. Is that all right on a Sunday morning? Anybody know anything at all about a thing called worry? It's not our first time. We taught many years ago. I remember teaching uh, three services in a row, and worry is sin. I've had a lot of practice since then. That's been many years ago. Uh, we've preached about God's substitute for worry. We might talk about that just a little bit when we close out here today. Uh, this is, is, again, not a new subject. Uh, worry is something that all of us have come face to face with. But I feel like God wants to talk to us out of the word of the Lord. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for the opportunity to be right here in this house. Thank you for the blessing of knowing you, knowing your word, knowing your unchanging promise, uh, knowing what you're able to do. We trust that word. We trust that promise. Uh, God, help us to encourage, to exhort, to strengthen uh, God to some way. Uh, help those toward good works uh, and a good walk with you, Lord. Thank you for the good word of the Lord. And all the church said, Amen. You may be seated. God bless you. Glory. It has been said, nobody is exempt from worry. The king or the pauper, the school teacher or the student, the boss or the worker, whether it be the general or the soldier in battle, the rich man and poor man alike are not exempt from worry. One worries about the money he doesn't have, and the other worries over the money that he does. And the list just goes on from there. 
And then I am convinced after this many years, this is my 50th year of having the Holy Ghost and living for God. And I am convinced that there are professional warriors. They just know how to get it done. I remember how many times my secretary has asked me through the years, don't you worry about anything? I said, well, I would, but you do such a good job at it. I'm just going to leave it to you. Hallelujah. But yet in all of this, there, there, even though you will not find the word worry in the Bible, God has specific commands in his Bible about what is called what we call worry. And again and again, those commands are saying, don't do it. Don't do this. Psalm 37, verse 1, fret not. That means don't worry. Fret not thyself because of evil doers. Verse 7, fret not thyself because of him that prospers in the way. Verse 8, fret not thyself in any wise to do evil, for evil doers shall be cut off. Now, there, there are always going to be, we know that. If you've lived very long in life, you know there are always going to be things you don't understand, things that you don't know where to place, and that's why the Bible just simply said, count it all joy. He wasn't talking about when you get a raise on the job. He wasn't talking about when everything seems to go your way. He said, count it all joy when you fall into diverse uh, temptations. Uh, he talked about don't think it's strange when these certain things uh, befall you. It's, it, it's a mind deal. And we're to set all of this so if you count it all joy. We preached about it in years gone by. You get people that's lived for God very long, preachers that have preached very long, uh, they have a great big joy column. Because when you can't put it anywhere else, when you can't do anything else with it, we have that command. Just count it all joy. Some things uh, you just have to know by faith. We'll understand it better by and by. God's got a purpose in this. Uh, God's got a work in this. Uh, his ways are above my ways. His thoughts uh, are above my thoughts. And so we simply Trust in the Word of God. When he's saying, don't fret, don't fret, don't fret, don't fret, there's something in that that's saying, you're going to have to put some trust in me. And when you can't figure it out, remember the old song, while we're trying to figure it out, God's already got it all worked out. Anybody believe he knows the end of your trial before the start of your trial? He who knows the, the, the end from the beginning of all things certainly knows uh, a little bit about the things that I'm going. In fact, he knows it all. He knows how to work. He knows how to bless. I heard it this morning as Elder Epley talked about Job uh, and trying to find an understanding. If I could just get to God uh, and plead my case uh, and he could explain some of this to me. He wasn't seeing the devil uh, before God. He wasn't seeing the thing uh, that was going on in the heavenlies. He was just enduring the battle. But some kind of faith uh, got into his heart. Uh, something about his walk with God uh, that said God's got this. God knows this. Uh, God's working in this. Uh, I've got a blessing in this. Uh, I'm not coming through this defeated. Uh, I'm not coming through this down and out. Uh, this is not going to destroy me uh, when I come through this. Uh, because God's got this. I'm going to come forth like gold. I will be the overcomer in this. Clap your hands, all you people. I'm just going to do this the way that I do it. But let me tell you the first thing I want to, I want to give you about worry. There's, there's, there's reasons God said, don't worry. Fret not. And there's other ways he said this. We're going to get to them in the word of the Lord. Number one, worry is unproductive. You take you a sheet of paper. 
you sit down and you try as you will, you will not be able to list one single benefit about worry. Worry will drain you of your time. Worry will steal your energy. And it will cause you to be a poor steward of both. Worry. Worry. By definition, worry in the scripture is to be anxious about something. To be what uh, the King James calls careful for nothing means don't worry about anything. That's just simply put and, and, and just simple in what it's saying. Somebody said, worry is like a rocking chair. It'll give you something to do, but it just won't get you anywhere. So God has some things better in mind when he calls our focus to focus on the word of the Lord. When, when we focus on worry, we are misfocused according to the Bible. Worry will take our eyes off God. Worry will make us forget uh, that this Bible is full of promises uh, for people that are just like us, uh, that are meeting situations in life and meeting battles of life and meeting... I'm not up here to tell you we don't have them. We have plenty of battles. And we have plenty of struggles. And there are plenty of things that are going on. I know I don't have to guess. I don't have to be prophetic in this. There are things going on in your life right now you don't like. You wish you could change them right now. It may be with a loved one. It may be with some kind of situation. It may be in finance. It may just be a trial that you're thinking, why in God's name uh, am I here? But to worry instead of claim a promise is unproductive. There have been large industrial firms that have done studies about why are certain, certain workers inefficient, what, what causes them uh, to, to be less than what they were or less than what uh, they felt like they could be. In nine out of ten cases, uh, they blamed it on worry. Worry can produce imaginary troubles or can take something that is smaller and make it through a shadow appearing to be much larger than what it is. Matthew 6, 27, which of you by taking thought can add one cubit to his stature? And why take you thought for raiment Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow, they toll not, neither do they spin. And yet I say unto you that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Verse 30, wherefore if God so clothed the grass of the field which today is and tomorrow is cast into the oven, shall he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? And then he says it again, verse 31, therefore take no thought. This is another biblical passage that is saying don't worry and he was dealing with the two basic needs of man what you shall eat or what you shall drink or wherewithal shall you be clothed the eating drinking and the bit two basic needs of man that he's dealing here and he's saying hey don't worry about this i've got this i'm taking care of this I'm the God uh, that knows how to take care of the lilies. Uh, I'm the God that knows how to take care of the sparrows. Uh, and I'm certainly going to tell you you're more valuable uh, than any sparrow. Uh, and so I'm the God uh, that will take care of this situation. Woo. Worry is unproductive, number two. Worry is unhealthy. Now, man, folks want to be healthy today. We may not eat like it, but we still want to be like it. We may not exercise like it, but we want to be. If we could, if they'll ever come up with that promised pill that you can just take once a day, and it will cause all the fat to melt off of you, you will be just as healthy and strong. Uh, it'll rip them in with muscles. Uh, it, it will just do what it's supposed to do for the lady folks. Uh, 
come up with it. Brother Groover, you can close everything else down. You've got it made. Hallelujah. But alas, worry is unhealthy. It will harm you physically. It will harm you mentally, emotionally. Hallelujah. I wouldn't have any problem standing up here and telling you that you can go out there and do the drug world and drugs are going to hurt you. You can go out there and you can drown your sorrows in a bottle and that drink is not going to help you. It's going to hurt you. That you can smoke cigarettes and cigarettes are not going to help you. They're going to hurt you. And we, we, maybe we could even have some success if we were up here teaching you your uncontrolled wrath or anger will hurt you. Your jealousy, your malice, your spirit of unforgiveness, these are all acids that destroy the container that carries them. And God has a remedy for every one of these. Can I get a witness? And God has a remedy for worry. Now, I may have a little harder time convincing you that, that worry is just as unhealthy as many of the things that I have just named to you. Now, you don't think that I'm up here trying to tell you that I am the epitome of perfection when it comes to not worrying. Man, I've had more tests lately than I want to have. I promise you that. That's not why I'm teaching this. I'm teaching this because I believe it. Because I read it in the Bible. Because I know it's right. I've preached long enough in the last 48 years uh, of my life preaching uh, to understand I've preached faith when I didn't feel faith. I preached a move of God when I didn't feel a move of God. I preached revival when I didn't feel revival. Well, so it's not about exactly how you feel. It is about when God said it, uh, we're going to believe it. Uh, we walk by faith uh, and not by sight. Uh, we walk by faith uh, and not by a feeling. Uh, Jesus said it. We are going to absolutely believe it. Uh, clap your hands one more time before you see it. Where it has been contributed to causing ulcers, Migraines, arthritis, rheumatism, digestive disorders, high blood pressure, heart trouble, colds, asthma, thyroid problems, blindness. You ready for me to quit? I got another page of it. Look at here. One doctor, a stomach specialist in Mayo Clinic, a man by the name of Averez, said, 80% of the stomach disorders that come to this clinic are not organic, but functional. In other words, they come from the mind. He said it. I didn't say it. He said it. Most of our eels are caused by worry and its twin, fear. According to the Scripture, the cure for fear is faith. According to the Scripture, the cure for worry is faith. I got an idea that our faith in God is more important than the food we eat. I got an idea that our faith in God and exercising that faith is more important than the exercise we do or we do not do. Can I get a witness? Charles Mayo himself said, Worry affects the circulation, the heart, the glands, and the whole nervous system, and it profoundly affects the entirety of our health. Let me quote a few more. Another quote from an MD. Worry sets up a general disorganization of the system. It makes and liberates uh, all sorts uh, of bodily poisons, throws glands and their functions totally out of gear, and lowers the resistance uh, to existent diseases, etc., etc. Now that I've got you really worried about worrying, I'm going to preach on just a little while. Let me make it worse. <laughs> Prolonged and great worry may mean an eventual breakup, or we call it a breakdown. Flabby heart, hardened arteries, premature senility, paralysis of the will, which can lead to all kinds of problems. Worry hinders not only yourself, it can hurt not only ourselves. It can hurt others. 
Look at your neighbor and tell him worry is infectious. It can be as infectious as a cold or the flu. It can get from us to a dozen others around us. And I am convinced that there's not many of us that doesn't realize sometimes you can get around certain folks and you feel like, man, I need to get away from that. Negativism is not real good on your faith. Doubt and unbelief and the speaking of doubt and the speaking of doubtful things and, and, and it's just not real good. I, I know. I know we've been there. I just don't understand God. I just don't understand why God allows this. I, I just don't understand. And, and, and those are substitute statements for what should be said. God's people should be talking the language of faith. And the language of faith is this Bible. If his word says I'm saved, I'm saved. If this word says I'm healed, I'm healed. If this word says I'm strong, I'm strong. If this word says I'm delivered, then I am delivered. This is our language. This book holds the promises. This book holds the things that God intends for us to hold to. As a substitute for worry, God bless you, you may be seated. Worry can become like a generational spirit that is passed down and around in the family. It can spoil your testimony. It can spoil the testimonies uh, of others around you. There was a sign that I saw one time that said, The fellow who worried yesterday about tomorrow isn't here today. Amen. So worry is not only unproductive, worry is unhealthy. Proverbs 3, verse 5, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not to your own understanding. You know what he just said? Don't worry. And all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy path. He goes on to tell us that these things that he's instructing shall be health to your navel. Now, sometimes I try to figure that out. I don't know what this deal is about a healthy navel, but it's got to be good if God wants you to have one. I think he's talking about it will not only affect you, uh, it will affect your posterity, uh, it will affect your family, it will affect those around you. Uh, there's just something to be said uh, about putting confidence in God uh, and confidence in his promise. Uh, it's healthy to do that. Uh, it's not healthy to worry. Oh, thank you, Holy Ghost. Well, we're doing good. I got 20 more minutes. Number three, worry is not only unproductive and it's not only unhealthy, worry is unwise. It's not real smart. Now, there's some things that the Bible teaches are not smart. Brother Evans called me one time and I said, Elder Evans, what you been teaching on? He said, well, he said, the scripture that said... Uh, be not unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is. I said, that's a good one. And he began to link it as only Brother Roger Evans could. And he was uh, telling me, he finally ended up, he said, when I finally got over there in Proverbs, and it said, he that committeth adultery with a woman. That with a woman means more nowadays than it used to. <laughs> a wound and dishonor shall he get at his reproach. Shall know. He said, he said, Brother Couch, it finally dawned on me what God was trying to say. Sin ain't smart. And that was his Bible class. His Bible class was sin ain't smart. Well, worry is not smart. Worry goes against every natural as well as every spiritual and Bible intelligence. It will tell you. It is not proper for God's people to worry. Now, this is not a positive thinking class. No. This is, this is strictly about the Word of God. We face two kinds of things in life every day that we live. The things we can help and the things we can't help. Those are the two things you're facing today. And to worry about the first is useless. Let's get things done. And to worry about the second, please excuse me, but really is stupid. Because you can't 
do anything about it anyway. It's going to have to be God. It is going to have to be prayer. It is going to have to be faith. Can I get a witness? Every one of us have to learn. Paul said, I have learned in whatever state I am in, therewith to be content. Now, do you realize, do you understand, do you feel like, can you perceive that Paul had his share of troubles? He took time to name the list, and when I read his list, and then I realize he called them these light afflictions when you compare them to the glory to be revealed in us. Paul had his troubles. And so uh, to be content with today's trouble means I'm not going to borrow from tomorrow and clutter up today. There's enough to do believing God, living for God, being my best for God, working for God today. Somebody done a study. What people worry about. Things that never happen. 40% of their time spent worrying is about things that never happen. Things that can't be changed. 30%. Needless health worries, 12%. Petty miscellaneous worries, 10%. Then he said, real and legitimate worries, 8%. Now, in the light of my text, I don't know that I can honestly tell myself I have any real legitimate things to worry about. Because I've done read a scripture text that says, be careful for nothing. Don't worry about anything. And if God told me that, God must have meant, from, God never told me or you uh, to do anything that we could not do without his help. Now there's plenty of things that are beyond my ingenuity. They're beyond my physical strength. Uh, they're beyond my ability. But there's nothing uh, that is beyond uh, the God, and I heard it quoted today, uh, that says the Lord is my helper. Uh, that means when my strength ends, uh, his takes over. Uh, when my ability ends, uh, his takes over. Uh, when my wisdom and knowledge and understanding uh, ends, uh, God's takes over four times. Boom, 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 boom. Jesus said, take no thought. Take no thought. Take no thought. To about the very basic things uh, that are important to life. He had to mean that. If I have to balance all this when I'm gone. This Bible does teach make preparation. It does teach plan for tomorrow. It does teach about setting things in order and so on. That, that's in the Bible and that's good stewardship. But that is far different uh, than what the Bible is warning us about. Uh, to fall into this state uh, of worry uh, in the light that we have. And I want to give you some of them uh, in the next several minutes. We have so many promises in the word of the Lord. Amen. First Peter 5 verse 7 casting all. Your care. Now this goes along with don't worry about anything. Be careful for nothing. Cast all your care upon him for he cares for you. You ever been tested on that? You ever felt like he didn't care? I dare say there's not a one of us if we've lived for God very long hadn't been through something that, that the enemy said to us God doesn't care. If he cared you wouldn't be in this. If he cared he'd do something about this. That's the devil's language. We know he cares. And just because I cast the care upon him doesn't mean I've seen the situation change. I heard one preacher say many years ago, he was tossing and turning, and, and uh, all of a sudden that scripture came to him. He was worried about something all through the night, and that scripture came to him. He that keepeth Israel uh, doesn't sleep or slumber. And he said he felt the Holy Ghost talk to him and said, look, if you go ahead and go to sleep, I'm going to be awake anyway. I'll, I'll handle this. Right. Amen. And so is our great, great God. 2 Corinthians 10, verse 5. And if you don't think this fits, it really does because this is where the problem of worry is. It's in the mind casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God, bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. I'm preaching to you that worry is unwise. Let me say it again. It will ruin your life. 
if you let it. It will make you miserable if you let it. It will steal your joy if you let it. I come to encourage somebody, but it will steal your faith. Faith is something you got to fight for, and faith is something you got to fight with. And worry will steal your faith uh, if we let it. Uh, hey, I think we got a faith that's worth fighting for. We got some promises that's worth holding on to. Uh, we got some truths uh, that's worth believing in. Uh, I'm going to say it again. Uh, these are just commandments in the book. Don't take thought. Don't take thought. Fret not thyself. Uh, cast all your cares upon him. Be careful for nothing. Uh, God didn't tell you anything. Uh, he didn't tell me anything to do that we cannot do without his help. Uh, clap your hands, all you people. I got two more and I got 20 minutes. Number four, worry is unbelief. I don't know how you'll separate them. Worry shows doubt. Worry shows a lack of faith in God's care and in the integrity of his promises. I copied this back some time ago when a man was praying in Congress. And as the man prayed, he said, Lord, save us from the sin of worry, lest stomach ulcers be the badge of our lack of faith. Amen. I don't know what them guys had to worry about up there, but anyway, that was his prayer. If God said, I don't want you doing this, then worry actually insults God. I'm not going to step out there too heavy, so I'm just going to say I, one man called it a kind of unconscious blasphemy. Now that sounds pretty strong, doesn't it? And I, it, that's, that's not stated to throw weight on anybody. That is stated to encourage somebody you got a great loving God. You don't have to understand everything about Him. You don't have to understand everything about what He's letting you go through or what you are going through to understand you got a great God that cares for you. When it boils right down to it, many a time I've looked at Job and I've said, God, what do I have to fuss about? What do I have to personally complain about in the light of that tremendous trial that God has given us to read and to look at in the book of Job? We count him blessed. Anybody feel like Job was not a blessed man? The book said we count them blessed who endured. But, you know, it's, it's one thing when you're looking at the end result. There is an end result to every situation in our lives. There is an end result to every circumstance uh, that we are facing in our life. Worry is a type of distrust in His Word, unbelief in His promise. And actually, can I tell you, worry treats God as a liar. Wherefore did you doubt? You know who that was said to? That was said to a sinking Peter that had stepped out of the boat by faith and got distracted with worry. Why did you doubt? Can you cause the barren soil with all your pains and toil to make lilies grow? You cannot, O oh helpless man, have faith in God. He can. Can you paint the clouds at eve and all the sunsets colors weave into the sky? You cannot, O oh powerless man, have faith in God. He can. Can you steal your troubled heart and make all cares and doubts depart from your life? You cannot, O oh faithless man. So have faith in God. He can. You know, we don't really shout about doubters and powders. Our testimony is not about losing our battles. 
It's about winning our battles. It's about being the overcomer. He always causes us uh, to triumph. Now, how much can you put in that word always? He always gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, triumph uh, and victory has always been the testimony of the church. It's always been the testimony of the Holy Ghost field. Uh, it's always been the testimony uh, of the saved. Uh, are there persecutions? Yes. Uh, all that live godly in Christ Jesus uh, shall suffer persecution. Uh, is there victory? Yes. Uh, are there trials? Oh, certainly. Uh, through much tribulation uh, will enter into the kingdom of God uh, is there victory in tribulation and trial uh, always uh, there is victory uh, God said it God stated it uh, God declared it uh, and what God uh, is forever looking for out of us is faith let me put this together in a way we told you that worry was unwise. The book said, if any man lack wisdom, let him ask of God. That gives to all men liberally and upbraideth not, and it shall be given him. But let him ask in faith, nothing wavering. For he that wavereth is like a wave of the sea driven by the wind and tossed. Let not that man think. He shall receive anything if worry is, is, is actually an unbelief, and, and oftentimes in the midst of the hardest trial maybe that people were facing or the circumstance that they really didn't understand... You know, when you, when you read these testimonies uh, about great victories and the heroes of faith and Hebrews 11 and all through your Bible, it, that's not telling us that these people were never down. Just when they got down, they said, I'm getting up again. It, it, it's not telling you that these people didn't get in situations in their, in their lives uh, that, that absolutely overwhelmed them. But they had this attitude that said, there's no time to quit. There's no time to slow down in this. God is going to do exactly what he said he would do. In the middle of Job's situation, when it seemed like it could not get any worse, and it couldn't. I mean, it had been his, his children. It had been his, his provision, his properties, uh, everything that he owned. It had been his wife. Uh, it had been his friends that had come. And so the term Job's comforters, that had not given him any comfort whatsoever. I mean, zero. Uh, and now he's talking all this. Oh, if I knew where I could find him. And somewhere in the midst of the mix, all of a sudden, God's steps in there and says stand up Job and be a man in this I want you to answer me some things where were you I'm God I don't have any right to doubt God doubt me yes doubt my abilities yes doubt my strengths yes I have no right to doubt a God that has touched my life. Give me his word. Uh, give me his great promises. Uh, when Joshua met the defeat that they met at Ai, it put him on his face. Uh, but the moment God stepped on the scene, uh, he said, get up, Joshua. It's, this is God's... Uh, attitude uh, toward unbelief and doubt uh, when there were situations uh, that 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 were that that were filled uh, with doubts and unbelief not one time uh, did god ever pet doubt not one time you read your bible did he ever say that's okay he said where's your faith how come you doubt it how is it you have no faith oh ye of little faith now, I'm just talking about the attitude of God that I found in the Bible. Don't you think I haven't had to repent uh, many a time? God, I don't have a right to complain. Uh, I don't have a right to doubt you. Uh, you are God. Uh, you are my creator. Uh, you are the deliverer. Uh, you are a God of all promise. Uh, and you will do what you said you would do. One time, there was so much unbelief. 
that your Bible says, Jesus marveled because of their unbelief. But there was another time. That this Roman centurion said, I've, I've got a servant at home and he's sick and, and he needs to be healed. And Jesus said, now this is a promise. I'll come and heal him. And the centurion said, no. I'm not worthy for you to come under my roof if you'll speak the word only. How do you get this faith? Well, I'm just, I'm just thinking about my position as a centurion. And I say to this one, go, and he does it. And this one, come, and he does it. I'm thinking about your position. I feel like the man having a revelation of who he was. You're God. And if you will speak the word only, my servant shall be in the book said, uh, he marveled. And there's only two times uh, where Jesus mentioned uh, not just faith. He asked for faith every time. He looked for faith every time. And by the way, according to Luke 18, 8, when he comes back and the trumpet sounds, uh, he's going to be looking for faith uh, when he comes back. He looked for it every time. But this time he marveled and said, I've not found uh, so great faith, uh, no, not in all uh, Israel. Well, I'm just going to tell you, I don't want him to go out of the apostolic church uh, to find great faith. Uh, I want him to find it here among us. Uh, I'm going to believe what you said. Uh, I'm going to trust in your promise. Uh, I'm going to lean on your word. I know we preached about it at Brother Jones's, but the woman of Canaan came through. And she was, she was burdened, and wouldn't you be? She had a daughter that had problems. And Jesus was the only one that could really meet that problem. And I'm going to tell you, when it boils down to it, and when the last amen is said, uh, and when it's all said and done, we're going to find out uh, Jesus is the only one that can help us. Uh, he's the only one that can carry us through. Uh, he's the only one that can take us over. Woo! And she came to him. And everything in the story, I've preached it, God knows how many times, uh, but everything in the story is uncharacteristic of Jesus Christ. Everything. He answered her, not a word. Now Jesus just didn't go around ignoring folks. He was the epitome of a gentleman. But he answered, he just kept walking. And she's not even asking for herself. My baby, my daughter, has this need. And then when she couldn't get his attention, she started pestering the disciples. What would you say pestering? Because it affected them so much, they finally came to Jesus and said, she's crying after us. She's making such a scene. Will you please send her away? And then he looks at her, and this is how he attempts to send her away. It's not meat to give the children's bread to dogs. I don't have anything for you. I'm not sent but to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. There's nothing that I have to give you. Did that deter her? Did that send her home saying, I give up? There's no use. Truth, Lord. I don't mind you calling me a dog. I don't mind being whatever I am uh, in your eyes. Uh, but even the dogs uh, get the crumbs that fall from the master's table. Uh, and I didn't come for a no. Uh, I didn't come to be disappointed. Uh, I didn't come to leave here without. Uh, you are my hope. Uh, you are who I'm looking to. Uh, you who are who I'm believing in. Uh, and for a second time, uh, and it was again a Gentile and not a Jew, uh, he looked at her uh, and said, Daughter, uh, great is your faith. Uh, be it unto you, uh, even as you believed. And from that very hour, uh, her daughter was healed. I'm going to say it again, God. Uh, I don't want you going out of the apostolic church uh, looking for great faith. Uh, I want you to find it among us. Uh, I want you to find it right here with us. Clap your hands one more time and give him glory.
It wasn't until David's worry was over. His little time of lingering in doubt was over. That in Ziklag, the Bible said he encouraged uh, himself uh, in the Lord. Uh, what's it mean? Uh, it means he dried those tears uh, and he got to looking at those promises. Uh, I'm the young man you anointed so many years ago. Uh, I'm the one that you used to kill the bear and the lion uh, and the giant in front of all Israel. Uh, and you've not changed uh, and your promise is not changed. Uh, he encouraged himself in the Lord. Uh, bottom line, uh, find detail uh, and David uh, recovered uh, all. Uh, how it's time for somebody to rise up uh, and recognize uh, where he is a form of unbelief uh, and I'm going to claim a promise. Uh, I'm going to quit wearying. Uh, I'm going to start believing. Uh, somebody said preacher easier said than done uh, but it can be done uh, because God never told us anything to do. That we were not capable of doing. I'm winding down with this. This is my final and last one. Weary. That is unproductive. Unhealthy. Woo, unwise. And unbelief. Weary. In the light of God's word. Is unneeded. I'm going to look at it again. Matthew 6, 25. Therefore I say unto you, take no thought for your life, what you shall eat or what you shall drink, nor yet for your body, what you shall put on. Is not the life more than meat and the body than raiment? Behold, the fowls of the air, they sow not, neither do they reap nor gather in barns. Yet your heavenly Father feedeth them. Are ye not much better than they? You read on down to verse 33, and it's going to say, but... Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all of these things shall be added unto you. You know good and well, not a one of us believe that God appreciates a lazy man or a lazy woman. God blesses industry. God blesses effort. God blesses work. God blesses labor. He just happens to not bless worry. And so worry is unneeded. Take therefore no thought for the morrow. This is after he said, seek first the kingdom of God. The morrow shall take thought uh, for the things of itself sufficient uh, unto the day is the evil thereof. Uh, the promise of all these things, uh, all these things uh, shall be added to you. God didn't lie. You know what he said? I've got this. I want you to bump your neighbor and tell him God's got this. I don't know what your situation is. I don't know what your current day's trial is. Uh, I don't know what the weight that's on you right now uh, and that you feel. But I knew, though, there's a God that's standing right here. Uh, Say, let me take that. Uh, I got this. Uh, I don't know uh, how you're trying to put it all together in the little details. Uh, but it's not. But I do know uh, there's a God that says, I got it figured out. Uh, just bring that care right here, right now. Uh, and lay it right here. Uh, I got this. Uh, I want you to let me take care of this uh, I want you to trust me uh, I want you to believe me uh, I want you to lean on me uh, because he that said uh, all things work together uh, oh no and we but we know uh, that all things work together uh, to them who love God uh, who are the called according to his purpose uh, they work together for what uh, they work together not for bad uh, but they work together for good uh, I'm saving you uh, I'm redeeming you. Uh, I'm making you my own. Uh, I am keeping you for all eternity. Uh, it will work out. Uh, I've got this. But my God, let's all stand. Somebody come help me. Shall supply all of your needs according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. Some things you don't understand. Some things you never will. Not on this side. He simply said, you can trust me. I'll not only do it, I'll do it right. And when I do it, it'll be for your good. And it'll work out for you.
I'm telling somebody right here, right now, God's got this. I'm not talking about happy-go-lucky, care about nothing, carefree attitude that, uh, no. I see someone, no, that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about taking it to Jesus in prayer. Be careful for nothing but all things by prayer. God's substitute for worry is a praying man and a praying woman. God's substitute for worry is the individual that by faith says, God, when I tell you about this, I can walk off and forget it because you won't. You won't ever forget this. I may come back in a little bit and tell you all about it again. But I can leave it there. I'm telling you, somebody needs to believe me when I'm telling you this God that says, I've given you exceeding great and precious promises. I didn't just give you a great promise. I exceeded that. I didn't just give you something precious in uh, a promise. Uh, I exceeded that. That's how God does. He is able to do exceeding abundantly above all. We can ask or think according to the power that works in us. And that God, uh, this morning, I am convinced, burdened me uh, in the early hours of this morning and to tell you God's got this you want to bring it to him this morning I know it's a Sunday morning and I don't know what time you usually get out I got 20 minutes but it's really 11 24 you got something you want to bring to him that says hey let's quit this unproductive stuff <laughs> let's quit this unhealthy stuff Let's quit this unwise stuff. Let's quit this unbelief stuff. Let's quit this unneeded stuff. Woo, hallelujah, hallelujah. And right on the heels of all that, don't worry about anything. Pray about everything. And the God of all peace. I've never seen worry be able to stay where God's peace is. That's the thing that he put all together here. We're going to worry about nothing. We're going to pray about everything. And great peace have they that love thy law. And the God of all peace is going to work for you. Is this all? Anybody else want to bring something that you say, Brother Couch, I, I, I feel like the word of the Lord's found me today. That I've been doing a lot more worrying than I've been praying. I've been doing a lot more carrying it on my flimsy shoulders than I am putting it on God's uh, great big shoulders and said, here, God, uh, I can't do this. Uh, uh, the peace of God that passes understanding uh, shall keep your hearts and minds uh, through Jesus Christ. Uh, he's got a peace that's greater than your understanding, uh, so you can quit worrying now. Uh, he's got a peace that's greater uh, than the situation that you can't figure out. Uh, you can give it to God now. Uh, let not your heart be troubled uh, neither let it be afraid uh, he's only saying child of God uh, you don't have to worry I've got this great peace abiding peace abounding peace never failing peace from the God of peace He's got it. He's got it. He's got it. And he said, I will keep him in perfect peace whose heart is stayed upon me. Lay your worries down. I don't mind repenting over my worry, God. I'm going to claim that promise right now. In the name of Jesus Christ, by the authority of our great God, walk through this house, that's all. You simply walk through this apostolic church. Lay your hand on men and women right now. That hand of strength, that hand of great promise, that hand of a word of faith. God's got this, sir. God's got this, sir. Yeah.
God, you got this. You got this. For caring, for working, for moving powerfully in my, that one touch. What a good God. What a good God. What a good God. What a great God. <laughs> ah, you got it, Lord. Yes. I tell you, Lord. Oh, yeah. He tell you, Lord. You got it, I believe. Would you pray with somebody? Would you reach over and do what the Bible said appropriately? Pray ye one for another that you may be healed. That can be physically, that can be spiritually, that can be mentally. Oh, God's a healer. Yeah, pray ye one for another. That's God's substitute for worry. We're giving it to you, God. We're putting it on you, Jesus. Hallelujah. And he knows what you're going through. Why don't you cast all your care upon the Lord? So many times we pray, and uh, God answers those prayers. If we're not careful, we let him go unnoticed, not recognized. We battled here for several months with little Zachariah. And uh, I'm going to tell you what, it did not look good at all. Every time they'd go back to Kansas City, it would be, the report would be worse. It wouldn't be better uh, to have this this uh, uh, rheumatoid arthritis still. His numbers, his numbers would be so high, and uh, uh, we just kept praying. We just kept talking to the Lord. We just kept praying, talking to God. And the last time they went back, it's gone. It's gone. I'm saying it's gone. They was done telling them, you know, he could be crippled or paralyzed and whatever. It's just a child, just a small child. Amen. My, what a message of hope today. Thank the Lord. I